most people out there, with the exception of us in the room and us in the industry, they don't really care about brands. So that's, you know, an awkward truth, but it's true. And, you know, we have to b- find the balance between looking at data that feels like it's knee jerk and then remembering that actually people are going to forget about this campaign campaign very, very quickly. Every brand should have that strong brand vision, build it, create the trust. So we often look at if they've lost their vision, they're really losing their, their, their path. So how do we identify certain metrics we can dial up in the media to help them build that vision back up and create the future potential of the brand? Hello, I'm Omar Oaks, editor of The Media Leader, and welcome to episode two of The Future of Marketing, our special series in association with Bloomberg Media. And if you're just tuning into this for the first time, if you've hit upon it by an algorithm or tuning into our podcast feed and wondering, what is this series? What are we doing? Then please do tune into episode one, where we had a really interesting conversation with Duncan Chater from Bloomberg and Steve Taylor from VCCP Media, talking about all things multi-platform, video, data, what tools you need. And we're about to expand on some of those issues today in episode two. Um, To join me, we have two very esteemed guests. We have um, Jackie Lyons, who is head of planning at Havas Media Network, um, and Bloomberg Media's head of data, science and insights, Emiya. Phil Robinson. Um, So first, um, hi, Jackie. Um, Firstly, explain to our audience, um, what do you do as head of planning? What do you do day by day? Who are your clients? What do you do? So I have one of those answers, which would be annoying, which is my days are very different, Omar. One day is not the same as another. Um, I sit right in the middle of the organisation. So I straddle um, my own, obviously, planning team into strategy, into, you've met Laura Kell, into the data team. I work very closely with activation as well. Um, And then obviously thought leadership, new business, things like that. So honestly, every week is a bit of a roller coaster at the moment and uh, changes dramatically. Great. And I'm actually going to embarrass Jackie. Um, she was actually named um, the one awards that we do, the Media Leader Awards. Um, she was named as a future media of the media, future. I'm going to get that right. Future <laughs> Media Leader of the Year in 2022. Yes. Um, and um, the, those awards are quite special because um, it's the trade body chiefs who are involved in the judging, um, which is unique in the industry. And um, the IAB CEO, John Mew, said of Jackie, Jackie really stood out from her ideas to her delivery, whether that be through her work, building new teams, establishing a new way of thinking across the organization and playing an instrumental role in landing new business and delivering award-winning campaigns so jackie t- reveal your secrets <laughs> wow. what is this new way of thinking why should we all be listening to you as opposed to the other heads of strategy in the industry oh um that's a hard question and you've definitely i wasn't prepared for that one omar so thanks for starting with that <laughs> um i would say i am someone who definitely speaks their mind so if i see something as being a little bit off i will be brave enough to say it and I think I'm quite friendly, so I can do that with um, a smile on my face. Um, and I, yeah, I think that's something that sometimes people don't do enough is just to, you know, um, shout out if they see something um, from a work perspective or, of course, in other aspects of the office as well, to shout out and speak up a bit more. So uh, watch out, Phil Robinson. Yeah, uh, Jackie's, so Phil. Jackie's going to um, be very kind, but tell you you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> With a smile on her face. Yes. Yeah, uh, I'll smile, but okay. like, yeah, be careful. <laughs> um, <laughs> see the daggers. Yeah, so we also have Phil Robinson um, from Bloomberg Media. So um, explain your role for our audience. Uh, very similar to Jackie. Every day is a different day in the Bloomberg Media. Always starts with us and ends with us. So we obviously have a range of data intelligence tools. Um, We're obviously known in the industry as a data insight company. So looking at audiences, brands, industries, really to find those insights to feed into RFPs, whether it's for our sales team, marketing team, creative team, planning team. So we always like to inform and inspire, learn, measure and provide those recommendations moving forward. Good to hear it. So no excuses, I review. We've got a media owner and a strategist um, who are here to um, combine thoughts to um, tell our audience what we're going to talk about today, which is the best way of measuring brand perception in the market. How can marketers craft responsive strategies that enhance their brand image? And what are marketers generally not doing when it comes to gaining data insights? So brand perception. What, Phil? What are the best ways of measuring brand perception? Um, Duncan, that's our year ahead event. He was he was saying to us that brands are not actually measuring brands enough. We've gone too far down the performance routes, if there's a distinction still between brand and performance. So 
let's start with measuring brand perception. How should we do it in 2024? Yeah, I mean, we've actually seen an absolute explosion in requests for measuring, you know, brand uplift, brand perceptions in particular. Um, so we, I mean, we have a range of ways, and I'm sure the industry does. Um, a lot of what we've been doing, and I've seen a bit of a trend in the industry, is to look towards, I suppose, tapping into that Ehrenberg Bass mindset of looking at the mental availability. Uh, so understanding, you know, how those top of mind associations have changed, how that media has impacted, showing it the positive negative shift across those associations. And even, you know, working with clients to really understand what those brand statements are they're really trying to shift. So, you know, whilst we still do those quite standard read a research panel, understand the questionnaire, but then also tapping into what's how that's changing across social media. Uh, analyzing that data, as well as across the entire sort of editorial narrative, which is a new one we're trying to bring in to say, okay, you're changing it in consumers' minds, but is that actually being impacted in the media itself? So we, we've got a, quite a range of ways of looking at, you know, audience, social, and the media itself to try and show that whole spectrum of how brand image is changing across. Yeah. Um, and Jackie, set the scene for us. Why does it matter? Measuring brand perception. So, yeah, brand perception, um, I agree with Phil, is something that's possibly overlooked a little bit sometimes. Um, and there is a bit of a resurgence in it. But I think um, the important thing is it's a, re a function of brand equity. And brand equity um, has been proven time and again to have greater outcomes um, than, you know, not running brand. So I think brands that see higher equity tend to have higher market share which obviously is very important. Um, there's a multiplier effect on equity and profitability as well. So if you have a healthy brand that a lot of people know um, and like, that's a good thing. Um, I think one thing to, to flag is it's not just about whether your brand has a positive image. It's also a really important part of that equity is also um, how salient you are and how well known and well reached you are as well. So there's two kind of forces coming together to deliver that equity. What about brands that maybe want to do something outside the norm? I mean, um, mention a positive brand image. What if you want to be an edgier brand or mm. you want to be known for doing different things? Is it is it much harder to, to measure that brand perception? I think measuring it will be similar, but how you uh, grow that brand and how you behave in comms might be quite different. Um, so all of these rules will apply in different ways for different categories. Um, you talk about Erin Bass and, you know, it, in that world, you're often talking about FMCG. That's a very, very, very different way of building equity, measuring perception and image uh, versus something that might be like a luxury fashion brand or a high fashion brand where that edge and that cultural cachet will be um, showing up in a different way. And, and, and to that point, we, we've been trying to align with the B2B walk effectiveness ladder from Cannes. So, they have the sort of strategic asset at the top, which is about understanding, you know, the big business effects there. And if you've gone to one of those PwC talks where we're talking more around earnings per share, how your compound annual growth rate has gone up, looking at sort of much more impactful business metrics uh, to try and get that top one. But I think as a publisher, we always struggle to get those big impactful business metrics to really show how the power of brand is impacting the sort of organization over and above just the brand image. And why is that? I think because most um, brands will be working with, you know, 10 media owners. So to try and ice for us to go to, you know, an advertiser, say, could we have your data to show mm -hmm. we've actually done a good job? It's a bit more difficult on that brand level, but a lot easier on way down the funnel from a conversion side of things. But I think, you know, when we were talking, it'd be interesting to start working a lot closer with agencies, really, um, to try and really show the impacts of what we're doing. Because obviously we do a lot of um, brand impact studies. We share it with the agency, it's shared with the clients, but if they're running across you know, 10 different publishers, it'd be really interesting to know what that holistic effect is and where we sit in that spectrum. So how do you measure? Yeah, I mean, there's loads of different ways. So um, the classic big brand perception agencies will be the likes of Kantar, Milward Brown, um, Hall and Partners do good work and, and you know for certain clients with certain budgets they'll be looking at that on a, a longer term basis and I think that's an important uh, synergy between the word brand and lasting effects which you hear often played out in uh, the world of AV or comms it's the same thing you want to be looking at these things with a long term view um, because the risk is you start measuring things on a weekly sentiment date basis with social which is also an important lens 
um, or, you know, you've talked about questionnaires. They're absolutely important, but just focusing on the long term vision rather than a knee jerk reaction can be important because when you get into that short term world, there's loads of clever things we can do and there's campaign uplift and there's brand tracking and those be different methodologies and how all of those different suppliers work as well. So there's a bit of unpicking the the value of the vision and then knowing you're on track, um, but without focusing too much on knee jerk reactions would be something that's very important. Well, yeah, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you put it as knee jerk reactions. Do you, I mean, are we still in 2024, are we still at a stage where marketers in your experience, talking to them, are they still too focused on what happens on social media when it comes to brand perception? I don't know if it's too focused because it sounds like it's the wrong thing to do, but there's so much data out there. Once you show somebody something, they're going to react to it. And if you have a campaign that has negative sentiment, I mean, you don't want your boss, you know, like you have to manage that conversation internally. Um, So there is a reaction often and it it is about that strength of character to remind everyone what you're building towards. Mm. Um, The other reality is like, you know, most people out there, with the exception of us in the room and us in the industry, they don't really care about brands. (laughs) So that's, you know, an awkward truth, but it's true. And, you know, we have to find the balance between looking at data that feels like it's knee jerk and then remembering that actually people are going to forget about this campaign campaign very, very quickly. So that's why that long term vision and understanding what you're building to is really, really essential. Accepting the premise that people don't really care about brands. <laughs> uh, is it? Is it? So is it more important just to have salience to be remembered rather than, fo- first of all, rather than focusing on um, the, per- the perception below that? Yeah, I mean, it's, we were obviously work with a lot of B2B brands. So, you know, understand that salience and consumers don't care about it very much in our world. Uh I think it's really how different is it for b2b in terms of um, compared to consumers because yeah you can imagine most consumers wouldn't have heard a lot of brands let alone care about them but it's it's different in b2b isn't it it is yeah i think i think everyone particularly on the bloomberg audience everyone has that base level of understanding you know mm. who they are what they offer whether it you know if it's a cyber security roughly offering cyber security so trying to tr- change perceptions which are so deeply ingrained in the brand and what people think stands for it's often the challenge for us and that's where we kind of dive into more trying to really understand if we're trying to talk about a sustainability message what are the audience reading about in sustainability to make sure that when we are creating the content or the media that that message say it's decarbonization is really coming through in the media to change that perception that moves away from just sustainability but to focus on decarbonization so there's it's it's a tough world because of that because sort of strong knowledge, particularly among business decision makers, C-suites of what brands stand for. So Jackie, as as the strategist, how can marketers craft responsive strategies that would enhance a brand's image, do you think? Um, So you you have to know where you're headed, which we've talked about already. And there's an important nuance there. So, you know, there's an increase at the moment, actually, Omar, in like people looking at their first party data, which is another hot, massive hot topic. And then like enriching it to understand what are the things that people who are in our current customer base care about and how can we use that data to enhance what our brand stands for. So if you have a very young customer base, you might find that they care about things like purpose of a brand, you know, societal change. That's very, very important to younger consumers at the moment. And that might be a lever you want to pull into how you show up in culture or how you show up in comms, as an example. The other interesting thing, of course, is thinking about what your growth strategy is, because you may actually be trying to pivot away from a certain audience. Your your base may not be representative of uh, the types of people you want to have as your uh, marketing base in the future. So there's that tension of, are, do you have the right base now? What are they telling you? But also looking at other data sets to say, what are insights we can uh, derive from other data sources to future proof our brand and make sure that the new people we want to attract in are finding our brand to be relevant to them. Um, And it does go back to that point about people not caring. People really don't. Like we have our Meaningful Brand Study, which is something like 90,000 people over 25 markets or something like that. So it's very, very robust. And people wouldn't care if 70% of brands disappeared tomorrow, um, which is a fact that we use a lot, right, at Havas, because um, it's so powerful and it's the uncomfortable truth that we face into. So building brands that are relevant to people um, is really important, but also being honest with everyone about how far we can take that is is, is valuable too. I was interested to hear about that. So do you, do you tend to look at it from a brand and audience perspective when you're building 
that strategy out or is there other elements that play into that? From a brand perspective, yeah, yeah. Do you so, start with the audience, or kind of starting with like the brand vision and the purpose of it. It'll it'll it will be case by case, okay, okay, for certain. So some brands will be excellent at understanding who their who their customers are, yeah. And in that case, you'll be fine tuning and painting out a picture of where the brand needs to go. In other cases, you'll be starting with the audience for for definitely and filling in gaps and enriching them to be beyond like a buying audience, which often can happen where we get like you know your brief is reach. Uh, 15, 34s, I mean, that's not going to give you a big equity campaign, is it? So um, we have a lot of work to do if that's the brief. Yeah, because I think that's what we, we see a lot of. Like, there's probably like a a distilling of audience insights down, you know, where, you know, when you're an agency, you're, you're obviously working with the, the, the brand themselves. They know a lot about the customers. You're probably integrating into the CRM, you know, a lot. And then when it kind of filters down to us, we get the the, we want to target C-suites or IT decision makers. And we're kind of going, where is all that value gone about understanding that audience? How's it how's it disappeared along the, the line? So, Is it getting easier to mitigate that, to, to fight back against that? Uh, I think for us personally, I think a lot of the media owners who have their first party data where they know exactly what a C-suite is reading about, you know, where they can fill in the gaps in the brief and then we go back and share, go, is this, are we along the right path? So I think we're definitely turning of sharing more, uh, filling in their gaps. And I think it'd be just great to go back to like the old days of, you know, getting people around the table going, what have you got? What have we mm. got? How do we fill in the gaps? Because um, like C-suites are just, a, they're a fascinating audience group when you look at what they consume on Bloomberg because they're coming for all the business news, so your ESG metrics, but they're also coming for their personal lifestyle content. So you'll see them reading about, you know, luxury travel watches. And we, you know, when you get a C-suite brief, it's, that it's as if they just have a B2B mindset and all they're doing is signing checks all day. So how do we tap into their sort of personal yeah, mindset absolutely. as well as their business mindset? And I think that's where we can start to try and change the course of what we're seeing. Jackie, what are you, in your experience, what have you found are the biggest uh, mistakes that marketers should watch out for when they're trying to craft these responsive strategies? One would be like forgetting how quickly and a campaign will disappear out of people's heads. So, you know, you can put all of your focus and get into this fishbowl mentality on this big campaign. Um, but it's the consistency of building that over time that will leverage results for a brand rather than like a single moment in time. So you have to think beyond a campaign and have like an annual strategy. That would be one mistake. Um, I've seen it so many times and there's so much money being spent and it's so hard to get it live because what we do is difficult, right? There's so many different stakeholders and then that's it. And that's it for a year. And that is definitely a big mistake, I think. Um, so that's one. Do you want to add one, Phil? What I think? No, no, I was just going to add to that because make we were having a conversation recently and they were very much about sustainable finance this year. So that's now been in their head, that's been ticked off. So we're now on to the next topic, you know, the next campaign. I was like, no, no, if we if we really want if you really want to be known for your offerings in sustainable finance, this needs to be a long-term brand image that we need to conduct over, you know, year after year after year. But in their minds, it's it's been done, we're on to the next. So Hearing yes. you say from your perspective, it needs to be, you know, consistent over time. It's definitely what we need yeah, to. Yeah, and then what are you measuring, right? Because that's what the conversation's about. And you can measure something that shows the campaign had massive uplift. But how do people feel about your brand in six months time? Yeah. Like it has to be sustained and it has to be growing in the right direction. And that's kind of what I meant about that vision at the beginning. So then, you know, every campaign, whether it's Bloomberg measuring it or somebody else, you're all moving in the right direction. And that's what's useful. Um, there's just so much data out there. It, you have to kind of unpick uh, the pieces that are building towards the puzzle you're trying to build. So you can have that conversation internally then for marketers, which will be important to show the value of everything laddering back up. And it's quite nice to hear we're on the right path because we, we build a sort of brand health tool where we look at how global business leaders perceive brands. So not just focused on the Bloomberg audience, but more to give us like an unbiased perspective on brands. So we always start that, you know, every brand should have that strong brand vision, build it, create the trust. So we often look at if they've lost their vision, they're really losing their, their, their path. So how do we identify certain metrics we can dial up in the media to help them build that vision back up and create the future potential of the brand. So it's nice hearing you talk about vision because it's definitely on our radar of how we help drive those brands. What about data-driven insights in particular? I mean, what are marketers generally not doing when it comes to gaining data-driven insights and how are they going to need to improve this in 2024? I think um, like a CMO's job is increasingly difficult nowadays. 
like when I get out my violin, when I first started working in advertising, um, but it was so much straightforward, like more straightforward back then. And now you've got like internal teams doing performance media. There'll be rich insights coming from there, right? You've got like a PR team who might be like getting really good at sentiment from PR content and, and stuff like that. You might have a data team in-house now who's dealing with first party data and they'll have like app profile data. And then you'll have media agencies with, we, we were very closely with YouGov. We've got tons of stuff we can share with clients. And it's how do you knit that all together? And I think that's a real challenge because it's hard when you're such a busy person, um, such a generalist suddenly dealing with all of these different agency worlds and and opportunities and data sets, um, knitting them together and making sure everybody can see everybody else's data is a thing that I don't think happens enough. And I can see why, because we're just trying to get stuff done. But, um, you know, having the strength to try and unify all of that into a single vision and story is something that needs to happen more often. I know we've overused this word so much in media, but you've touched on it in there, storytelling. Just obviously, you sound such huge amounts of data, but being able to piece them all together to create a story or a persona about an individual, an audience, that's what's absolutely key. Uh, particularly in our world, you know, I could tell you everything about C-suites, high net worth, you know, CFOs, but if I just send a load of data points to you or respond in a brief, it doesn't mean anything. It's being able to sort of curate all those data points of what type of media they engage with. You know, we see high net worths, 90% of them are on mobiles, they're more video focused, they're reading about equality. So being able to sort of create that story and show what they read and build up that persona really helps, I think, in our world, understand that audience better and be able to respond to briefs. Yeah, <clears> and, <throat> and then like, you know, for a CMO, they're going to have the audience data and they'll be in the middle, right? So they'll have all of these agencies with various different data sets. They need to be able to take that data and storytell it to have a co co cohesive story around that audience. But also then, of course, ladder that back up to the CFO and, and change that storytelling narrative to something that delivers on business results. So it, it is a very difficult role, I think, nowadays to, to understand how all of that comes together and then translate it into the value for your business. Yeah. I mean, we, we, there's some fun ones we work with. I know I spoke B2B, but we all work with some luxury fashion brands where, you know, using some of the syndicated research, understanding what actually drives luxury purchases. Um, and we, we saw like this year, it was all about heritage. Um, and interesting, we spoke to our Bloomberg intelligence analyst who, you know, develops a lot of invest reports in the luxury industry. And she was showcasing that what they saw in the luxury was that people that didn't, the heritage brands last year were the only brands that grew from a compound annual growth rate and earnings per share. So it's quite nice from our perspective when you got to start to see those audience insights actually equate to full business metrics, because yeah. that's when you can speak to the CMO and the CFO to show this is working. You're, you're reminding me of another important um, angle on that, which is understanding what the drivers for your brand are. Um, which and in your the example you've just given heritage clearly is something that's coming through as being important, and I think that's one of the the risks of looking at all of this data is you start measuring everything, and you mm. need to be single minded on what's the one or two things that you know is going to deliver growth for your client, um, or your your brand, and yeah, an example coming to mind. I was fortunate enough years ago to work on Diageo and Guinness, mm. and you know they worked with Kantar at the time, and. They won't mind me saying because it's kind of obvious what their uh, brand, if you were to look at like meaningful, salient and uh, different, which is how Kantar stack a brand model, um, you can guess that different is going to come through very strongly for something like Guinness, right? Mm. Because it comes as an essence of the product that's pushed through everything else. Um, so if you know that you're doing that one well, what's the other one thing you're going to do next? And it could be salience, it could be meaningfulness. It, it will depend on your on your brand, but picking one or two things and focusing on them, I think is really important for a CMO to look at today. So being clear about everything they're seeing and picking the single-minded um, strategy that will, that will push forward. And even though, as you say, it will depend from brand to brand what they should focus on those one or two things, are there generally other things that too many brands are focusing on too much that they shouldn't be? I mean, purpose is the obvious one there, right, that we, we talk a lot about as an in industry. Um, and I think the reality is consumers nowadays are really savvy. Um, we're operating in a world which is negative. You know, there's a lot of pressure on people and purpose can get very worthy. 
And actually, when when Kantar talk about meaningfulness, they don't mean it in terms of purposeful. They mean it in terms of like does what it says on the tin, which also can get translated incorrectly, which is a big, um, as you can imagine, risky strategy if you get that wrong. So I think what people want are brands who are transparent and have integrity. Um, but they also want a lot of fun from brands nowadays. We see that in our Meaningful Brands report. They want a little bit of an escape from all of this negativity um, around at the moment. And so you see that actually also coming through in the likes of the Can Lion work. If you talk to System One, there is a little bit more fun coming through the industry. And I think that's a response to what we're seeing as a desire from people and how they want brands to fit into their lives. Yeah. And I think we see that from our perspective. Like, and I know you talk brand purpose and we have that. B2B is the ESG, which I think we're over that sort of hump of everyone talking about ESG, which... What does that mean? We've done it now. Tick. We've done, yeah, yeah, We've done yeah. ESG. Yes, of course, like sustainability and everything in that space is very important. But just do the right thing, you know, have integrity. That m- might not be your outward facing message to your, you know, advertising and your comms. That might not be what you push out. It doesn't mean you don't do the right thing. Treat your people well, um, focus on your, your own scope three situation, whatever it is. Um, But don't make it the focal point of your outward facing comms, because that's where it feels disingenuous. I feel feel like um, slowly um, the elephant in the room is emerging where um, the things you were saying before about brand perception, generally people don't care about brands, generally maybe marketers focusing on some of the wrong things when it comes to measuring brand perceptions. But at the same time, purpose transparency honesty and advertising isn't the elephant in the room here that brands just like to play it safe because as you say it's a it's increasingly fractious negative media environments where people can be called out if you do the wrong thing we've just had you know the christmas ads where was it was it mns for daring to use red gold and green they're accused of you know using palestinian flag and things like that get blown out get Get, mis, get misconstrued all the time. Isn't that the elephant in the room that brands are just, they, 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 they need to play it safe because they're operating in this kind of environment? Yeah, I think if, if you don't have, if your house is not in order, we'll say, um, there is no point in trying to get into the world of purpose. Um, for me, I think that the difference is the business versus the brand. Like the business should do the right thing. There's no doubt about it. And, and people want businesses to do that. Um, they want p- to know that their staff are being paid properly. They want to know all of their ESG is in the right place. But when it comes to the brand, that doesn't have to be show up in the same way. That doesn't have to be the same personality as the business. Um, so that's the, the tension as well. So I think just be careful what you're playing with in culture. When you open something up to culture and open something up um, in that space, people will jump on you. So if you don't have the credibility and integrity to back it up, you're going to get into hot water. Um, there's also the reality of like, if your brand isn't naturally purposeful, why are you trying to do that in the first place? You're not Patagonia. Mm. You know, if you're trying to just sell toilet paper or whatever, like, is it the right, is it the right uh, strategy for you in the first place? People are buying brands based on their own values. And we're seeing that in, you know, high net worth C-suite that they're actually aligning to their personal values and purchasing brands or products that align to what they're doing internally. So we see in C-suite data as well, like our own data, it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. People in C-suite tend not to have the same financial problems as your average customer on the street. And so they can afford to focus their brains around higher level um, information like EC- ECG and sustainability. It's, it's naturally yeah. something that's at the forefront of how they think. Whereas, um, you know, your average Joe blogs on the street isn't there necessarily. Yeah. And we've seen like actually C-suite, like the say it's environmental within the ESG, that they're now getting measured on a personal basis as well as on a business basis. So while they might be looking for, you know, sustainable companies that can help them achieve their business goals, then it's now filtering down into their personal lives because it's a personal metric in business. So it's going, it's they're getting fully ingrained in the audience, not just a business purchase, but in that personal sure. mindset as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we got into this in episode one, but I wanna for the first for the final few minutes, I want to get into this this thing about marketers needing to be more strategically um, important within their own organizations. 
it is clearly really important. Jackie, you mentioned Future of Brands last year. We had a closed doors event for marketers, CMOs, marketing directors, and this idea about you know wanting marketers to be elevated more within the organization, to be as important, frankly, as Steve Jobs was to Apple, where as the CEO, he was effectively the marketer in chief. Um, and having that dual function actually allows marketing to be involved in the strategic development of the business, not just you know do some advertising and consumer market research, etc. Um, Phil, why do you think it's important for marketers to be strategic leaders and what support, if any, can they get in terms of tools, expertise? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes back to showing the impact of what they're doing. Um, I mean, I remember years ago we did a project with BMW Group and they'd never really gone down that content path before. So they were all very nervous as marketers in the company because it was quite you know, a significant investment. And I remember going to present the results and it there was just one like simple visual chart of what do you, what those top of mind associations that when you think about BMW, you know, it's expensive German car. And it was all about the future of the company and it all, you know, the next word chart was all around innovation, amazing love emotions. And it came through and they used that one slide to go up to their board to show this is the power of content. This is the power of what we're trying to achieve. And even though it was quite a simple slide, quite a simple measurement metric, they showed the impact to their board of what, you know, they were really trying to achieve to change the perceptions of the brand. So having those impacts, I know, you know, we talk about like case studies, just being able to show what you're actually trying to achieve and the sort of long-term goals is really important. Jackie? Yeah, I think it is. It's translating all of the work you're doing into something that will be a meaningful insight to your board um, or your CEO or whoever it is who may not have the same level of depth of knowledge of how, you know, advertising works. That is yeah. that is critical. And also, like, let your agencies in and help you build that story. It's another, like, uh, pet peeve of mine of, you know, when people ask you for stats. Uh, can you tell me how this did? Or can you tell you, and instead of saying like the brief is, I've got a really tough meeting, my CFO tomorrow, and I need to build a story. Like we can help you. We can help you. We're all on your side. It's good for us too, if you get that meeting right, you know, so do like share that load and, and with bring your agencies together to help you craft that story. And yeah, we're seeing a lot more of that. It's like, I've got a meeting with the board. I really need to prove what's happened. And you generally want to help them. You go, okay, well, it's good for you. It's good for us. Let's really get together and show, you know, and they give you a bit more of a profile of the board, you know, who's the who's the stickler, who's the more visual person. And we're, you know, producing a lot more, you know, one sheeters or just the stats. Some people just want the stats. Some people want the visualizations just to show this is actually how we are changing the brand. This is where we're going with it. And like Grace Kite does amazing work in this space, right, of like helping CMOs translate their own data into something that will be more meaningful and, you know, business facing to people who don't care about advertising. And um, so leaning on people like that, if you need to, if it's if it's your if your company doesn't get it, you know, figure out the right narrative that, that they will understand that helps deliver that value. Is that getting easier? I mean, um, we often hear that, you know, um, where marketing needs to be treated as, you know, capital expenditure investment. Don't just look at it as a cost. Do you think that argument is um, getting stronger? It's filtering through. Is it getting easier? It's just getting access to that kind of information. I mean, I'd, I'd love to, I mean, obviously we briefly mentioned econometrics a while back, but being able to then show that business impact and have that relationship between the CMO and the CFO of this isn't a cost expenditure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've also, yes, no, also no, no. I've seen CFOs who say things like, I don't believe in econometrics. And then then you're back to square one. And, and why is that? Why is that? Why do they Because it doesn't tell the story that they they know or or respect. So I think it it, it honestly it's case by case. Um big brands, your Unilevers, your PGs, they've cracked it. And we all saw over COVID, like they held spend, they managed mm. to continue to grow their market share. Um, it's smaller brands who maybe don't have the, the bench of A, you know, marketing expertise um, or B, uh, you know, finance people who get it. So there's an education job that to, to build around both those groups, depending on where your brand is on their own journey. Um, but I think the UK does very well. Like, you know, if you listen to other podcasts internationally or you read other reports from the States or other places, I think we are, as a nation, doing really well in the space. We have all of the IPA, all of the effectiveness, our culture in advertising is far and above anywhere else, I think, in the world. So I try and find some solace in that. Yeah, and I, I think to that, like, where we talked about that brand versus conversion, I think that's the the one sometimes we struggle with the, the CFOs is if they're just looking at 
you know, if it's a trading platform, how many people have converted, how many people signed up, how much are they spending? And that's the only metric they're looking at. And we're going, yes, but we've built the brand equity. We've created market share. There's always going to be some sort of tension and being able to talk to a CFO about brand equity and the value of it versus how much are they spending on our platform. Well, it's you know, tough. We were doing our own trends report um, back in December for the year ahead. And one of the things we put in was, you know, get comfortable with being uncomfortable mm-hmm. because this whole year, you're, you could have a, a retail a CFO who understands that a certain amount of ratings per week generates a certain amount of sales and, and that they're comfortable with that. All of the media world is changing rapidly around us. The cookie list is coming. You won't be able to look at last click. You won't be able to look at all of the short term metrics that they probably find amazing and enticing because they're showing action. So all of that's changing anyway. So a CMO has to really get their head around how to tell a new story this year. Um, in, in 12 months time, if we were to recreate this this podcast, the world of measurement will have changed so dramatically that if you haven't found the right way to change that narrative in your own business, you will be at risk of cutting spend and, and, and you know, not getting the, the value you need from your, your comms. Yeah. And, and there's only so many times you can repurpose the long and short of it charts of, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I wish they'd like tarted them up a bit, you know, yeah. when they first made them because they're used so, so widely. They're so, yeah, they could have done a little shading or, you know. Yeah, no, yeah, every presentation. Yeah. This is why you should continue spending throughout a recession. Yeah. So, so if not showing that chart to wrap up, what's the one thing that you could do to help them or they could do to help themselves? Phil? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to go down a sort of a, a platform route, actually, because I, th- I think what we often do is you just look at a campaign and go, it was a success or this is what we've done for your brand, but then really trying to give them more pieces of the jigsaw, essentially, of going, right, here's what your digital's done, here's how the print's performed, here's how TV's create that fame, here's how your content's changed your brand perception. So packaging it all up and showing the individual details to show that the the sum is greater than all of its parts. I think that's going to be really powerful moving forward so we can continue to you know, show the power of the, you know, the entire media ecosystem. And what about you, Jackie? I, I think that the world of media, and I would say this as a, a media agency person, the world of media and marketing is increasingly getting closer. And that's because of first party data and what that holds in the future. So I would say let your agencies in would be the one thing. Like we're on your side, we'll build it together with you. Um, and, and, and remembering that we're on your side and trying to build it with you. you share your data and, and build a culture with your teams that understand what everyone's laddering up to. They're, they're the, the pieces I would go for. Okay, thank you both so much. We unpacked lots there and we have another hour in the studio. We could unpack lots more. But listener, viewer, please do tune in for episode three where we're going to get into storytelling. Uh, Maybe even tell some stories as well. I don't know. Um, But yes, um, thank you for listening and watching to the Media Leader podcast. This is a special series in association with Bloomberg Media and we're really grateful for their support and putting this on. And of course, um, to our production partners, Trisonic, Um, you can see all of our episodes at the Media Leader podcast by subscribing, which you absolutely should do. And please do uh, keep up with what we're doing at themedialeader.co.uk. Until then, bye-bye.